the last 40 years, Nicholas van Hoogstraten has been a slum landlord with a string of convictions for violence. Violence which has helped him build an empire said to be worth 200 million pounds. Today, he's been found guilty of manslaughter for hiring two hitmen to kill a business rival in July 1999. Just before that murder, he spoke of his life and violent career. I've done a few things in my life that um, probably um, I regret them now, yes. I hope you're not going to ask me what they, what they were. <laughs> this is the story of the rise and fall of Nicholas van Hoogstraten. Three years ago, the Sunday Times Rich List ranked Nicholas van Hoogstraten among the wealthiest in Britain. In an interview at the time, the nation's most infamous slum landlord spoke of his pride and joy, Hamilton Palace. If one goes back a couple of hundred years, everybody that had made money or were of any importance in, in, in the world or in their country, they, they commissioned the, the building of their own um, country house. He claimed to own a million acre estate in Africa and properties throughout the world. I maintain homes in Cap Ferrar, Cannes, Barbados and Maryland, um, plus I've got bolt holes in numerous other parts of the world, you know, just sort of overnight, one bedroom, two bedroom flats which we have left here, left there. His empire, which has included thousands of properties in London and Brighton, has allowed him to indulge one of his real passions, antique French furniture. You know, I sometimes make the joke that somebody up there is looking after me and, and I mean, that's all I can put it down to. The man once dubbed Britain's worst slum landlord was born 57 years ago on the outskirts of Worthing on the south coast. Nicholas Marcel Hoogstraten, he added the van bit later, was the son of a cruise ship wine waiter who spent months at sea, leaving Van Hoogstraten and two younger sisters to be brought up by their mother, Edna. Even at a young age, he used violence to get his own way. He was the master in the household and quite often tell me about how he used to um, uh, beat his mother or strike her if uh, she didn't do exactly what uh, uh, he wanted her to do. Van Hoogstraten was an unusual child. He made few friends but dedicated himself to making money. I think my first entrepreneurial flair came whilst I was still at school. I was out doing a paper round, there was only money collecting driftwood off the beach and I, and I was already buying and selling postage stamps. In the late 50s, rare stamps rose sharply in value and became an excellent investment. The young schoolboy collected avidly and astutely. He claims his skills at stamp dealing set him on the road to riches. By the time I was 15 or 16, I already had at least um, a stamp stock, philatelic stock, that was worth something like 25 to 30,000 pounds at the time, which was, which was a lot of money in those days. Money gave him power, and he used it to control and subvert some of his more impressionable peers. But he had a little clique that used to gather around him, and you got the impression that they were doing a bit of stealing for him and he was doing a bit of flogging. And it's his first bit of on the road to fame and fortune. One, two, three. In 1960, aged 15, he was found guilty of receiving stolen goods and fined. To straighten him out, his father got him a job on a cruise liner as a laundry boy. One of his first voyages took him to the Caribbean, where he spotted a business opportunity in an area that would fascinate him all his life, property. The Bahamas was one of the places that the cruise liner visited. It, it was totally undeveloped in those days. And I immediately saw the potential. I mean, I just got in. I was in the right place at the right time. According to Van Hoogstraten, he used his stamp collection as security to buy and sell land options in the Bahamas. After just under a year at sea, he returned to the UK in 1962, claiming he'd doubled his fortune. While other teenagers were discovering the swinging 60s, Van Hoogstraten was looking for the quickest way to make more money. 
wasn't long before he found it. We start with the story of a man. Let me say straight away a sordid story that some of you may well not want the younger children to hear. This is Peter Rackman, a man who was the centre of a web of shady property deals, one of Britain's big-time 20th century racketeers. Van Hoogstraten was inspired by the success of notorious slum landlord Rackman, especially his exploitation of sitting tenants. Sitting tenants paid low rents and had long-term tenancy agreements, making it almost impossible to evict them. So properties with sitting tenants could be bought cheaply. But if a tenant left, the value of the property rose sharply. They were houses with sitting tenants in, paying very small rents, which in those days one would buy them for three or four, five hundred pounds a unit. A house which, uh, vacant, was worth two and a half, three thousand pounds. In 1962, aged 17, Van Hoogstraten started buying properties with sitting tenants in Brighton. A local journalist found out what he was up to. He would get up to all the old Rackman tricks to get the tenants out, like putting in his goons up above them, and they would create a racket all night long, hold all night parties, and generally just harass the family below them until they gave up and got out. Thirty years on, Van Hoogstraten was unrepentant about his tactics. I think I probably got my harsh reputation because of my problems with um, what were in those days sitting tenants or, or you know people that really were, were living in, in quite nice houses and, and paying nothing for them or relatively nothing because of that, that was legislation at the time. Everybody else saw him as a property racketeer but through his own eyes in the mirror of his own mind he was something to be looked up to Robin Hood for the rich rather than for the poor. By 1967, Van Hoogstraten, claiming to own over 300 properties in Brighton and Hove, pronounced himself the nation's youngest self made millionaire. But wealth wasn't enough. That just having wealth wasn't a sufficient kick for him. There had to be something else. He had to be almost risking that wealth. Nicholas Van Hoogstraten seemed addicted to risk and enjoyed violence. He associated with figures from Brighton's underworld and dealt in stolen antiques. When one former business partner was slow repaying a debt, he arranged for a hand grenade to be thrown through his sitting room window. In 1968, aged 23, Van Hoogstraten was found guilty of that attack and of receiving over 100 pieces of stolen silver. He was sentenced to nine years. Many thought the dandy millionaire wouldn't survive Britain's toughest prisons. In fact, he thrived. He used his wealth to buy protection from inmates. But when he bribed a prison guard, he was caught and was sentenced to a further 11 months. After serving just over four years behind bars, Van Hoogstraten was released in the spring of 1973. Prison had done little to diminish him, and he was soon back on the warpath, at first against the local council over unpaid rates on his property empire. He used to keep uh, buckets of his own urine or feces or whatever, and of course he used to take great delight at throwing or tipping these over the bailiffs or whatever calling at the door of his office. Uh, and that's what made me realise that this guy had never left prison. I would have thought prison life would have crushed him, but it seemed to have had the reverse effect. Here it took somebody who already was a very dangerous member of the community and actually built him into something ten times more dangerous than when he stepped inside had risen sharply in value. Working on a tip-off, journalist Michael Litchfield witnessed a typical Brighton eviction. This Rolls Royce came round the corner and out got Hoogstraten. 
He's wearing pinstripes, uh, black shiny pumps. Uh, but the most significant thing about his attire was this enormous pink carnation on his jacket lapel. And the next thing, we saw him at an open window on the first floor with two of his goons pushing out a mattress and other belongings into the street. And his goons were smiling and laughing and it again came back to this kind of clockwork orange image that the violence was very integral to their activity. And he started explaining to me that this had been a lot of fun. Was I impressed? It was a blitz operation. And he was enthusing, almost orgasmic. Van Hoogstraten gained notoriety on a national scale. In 1974, aged 29, he was charged with unlawful eviction and fined. He sold off the bulk of his holdings at the height of the property boom and, claiming to be worth tens of millions of pounds, became a tax exile in Liechtenstein. But Nicholas van Hoogstraten would not be away for long. In 1974, 29-year-old millionaire Nicholas van Hoogstraten was living as a tax exile in Liechtenstein, but still had extensive business interests in Britain. He began an affair with an older woman, Shirley Green, and lent money to her husband, Cyril, to convert their family home, High Cross House in East Sussex, into an old people's home. When Cyril died, Shirley learned that Van Hoogstraten had received the deeds to High Cross as security against his loan. He now claimed High Cross was his. When Shirley challenged this, he reverted to his old tactics. It started with the odd threatening phone call. Then it progressed to the front gates getting locked. And then they started to drive around the estate and they drove through the fence fields and smashed down the fences and just made mayhem, really. And we got up one morning to find that about a three, four foot trench had been dug wide as well as deep. Van Hoogstraten then resorted to physical violence and attacked Shirley's dogs. Nick peered out of the bushes dressed in a long black leather coat or something and um, he just said to her that he just massacred them. She found the dogs were covered in blood. In the end two of them died eventually from their wounds but not straight away. Shirley moved the terrified residents out of High Cross and, unable to stand the intimidation, left for good. She'd lost her home and her business. But his high-profile antics attracted the attention of the Inland Revenue, which launched an investigation into his UK affairs. In 1981, he was forced to pay the taxman nearly three million pounds, the largest ever personal tax bill at that time. Since then, he shrouded his financial affairs in secrecy. He operates from anonymous offshore companies using assumed foreign names like Adolf von Hessen. After six years abroad, Van Hoogstraten returned to Britain in 1980. The political climate had changed. He believed the new emphasis on enterprise and home ownership chimed with his own beliefs. And the first stake anybody should have in a country is the ownership of the roof over their head. If they haven't got that, they haven't got self-respect. In the early 80s, he claimed to have bought over a thousand homes in London. In the subsequent property boom, their value rocketed, making him even richer. But he was back to his old tricks, using henchmen to terrorise tenants and literally throwing families out into the street. Well, I don't look after tenants. I mean, why should I look after tenants? I mean, one looks after the building, looks after one's asset. 
can't extend it to looking after the tenant. I mean, because the tenant's spending his money uh, down the betting shop and um, smoking cigarettes. Before the property crash of the late 80s, he sold off his London portfolio and now claimed to be worth over £100 million. He turned his attention to more personal matters. He seemed to yearn immortality and social importance and set about creating a dynasty. It was one of my early ambitions in life to retire in Bermuda, um, the capital of which is Hamilton. And I decided to give all my children the surname of Hamilton. Um, so it is, it's naturally gone on from there. I suppose it's a, it's a way of setting up a, a, a dynasty. Between 1985 and 1997, he fathered four sons and a daughter by three West African women, who he refers to as his baby carriers. I mean, he hates women. He has the same relationship to women as a colonial slave owner has towards slaves. So he sees himself as a, the master apart, and they are so many chattels. I did say he was mad, didn't I? Two of his former wives live with their children in England. The third, Agnes Numu, lived in his flat in Cannes with their son until 1999 when Van Hoogstraten came for him. He said, OK, uh, I'm taking my son to Zimbabwe. I said, what? To Zimbabwe? I, said, I was surprised, OK. So he said, uh, he said I said, for how long? He said, oh, for, for two weeks, something like that, two or three weeks. Agnes hasn't seen her son for over two years. She's been refused a visa to travel to Britain and lives on social welfare in Cannes. She says she can't afford a legal battle with her ex-husband. He said to me, oh, he's my son, he's not yours anymore. He doesn't need to keep my child away from me. I love my son. It's the best thing God gives me. He must wonder somewhere, there's my mother, somewhere. Agnes's son now lives near the south coast with one of his ex-wives, just miles from where Van Hoogstraten is creating a family seat befitting his dynasty. In the late 80s, he commissioned his architect friend Anthony Brown to design a palace to be built on the site of High Cross House. His vision was of a white palace on a hill. So when he came to me about it, that was the uh, brief I want the White Palace on a hill. So he had a hill which had a little brown palace on it, and the little brown palace burnt to the ground, quite by coincidence. Nothing to do with him. And I set about designing a big white palace. Built on the proceeds of his property empire, Hamilton Palace will house what he claims is an enormous collection of antiques and art. But the public will never set eyes on his treasures. Well, there is no question of me ever opening my palace to the public. I mean, who wants public walking on their carpets? It's not just the general public that'll be banished from Hamilton Palace. So too will Van Hoogstraten's family. Neither his children nor their mothers will be left a penny. And he's arranged that when he dies, the palace will be sealed up with his body and his art treasures entombed inside forever. This, well, it doesn't look like it at the moment, it looks like a car park. This, in fact, is the mausoleum. It will probably be in Egyptian taste, and I'm sure that's where people were entombed with the intention of them being entombed for thousands of years, so I, I can't see anything wrong in, in, in following that, um, that theme. It is possible that, uh, that part of my idea of building the palace and filling it with my art collection is a way of abdicating responsibility for the vast wealth that I've acquired. And maybe I'm not comfortable with not being able to find an outlet for it. I, I, I feel that there's something I should be doing and, and, and I'm not sure what it is. In the mid-90s, he believed he'd found a worthy outlet for his riches, Zimbabwe. Introduced to the country by tycoon Tiny Rowlands decades before, he owns over a million acres of farmland and considers President Mugabe a friend. 
Britain's most infamous landlord had turned over a new leaf. He was actually improving the living conditions of his African tenants. I can't live with myself being an owner of such vast enterprises, assets, and having control over several thousand people's lives while they're living in such conditions. I can't do it. It could be a kind of salvation. Could be. A psychiatrist would need to tell me. When in 1999 the Sunday Times Rich List calculated his worth at 200 million pounds, few could have foreseen that his Midas touch would soon desert him. In Zimbabwe, political upheaval saw his farmlands overrun by squatters. Then, claiming to have already spent 40 million pounds on Hamilton Palace, his relations with his architect and his builders reached breaking point. I'm going to say it again, because just I told you months ago. Yeah, yeah, no, it was there, but you just slightly changed it there. Start talking crap. You f***ing idiot. Oh, f***ing idiots. Even after I've pointed out that the error was a mistake, the f***ing thing still gets built. Oops. I've got f***ing idiots working for me. Then, in the summer of 2000, architect Anthony Brown quit soon followed by the builders who claim he owes them half a million pounds and have issued a writ. He's counterclaiming their work wasn't up to scratch. It's still there. Other people can go and pick it up if they want to deal with Nick, if Nick wants to deal with them. But that's pretty unlikely. It's going to make a lovely ruin. By 1999, the spiralling costs of the palace and political unrest in Zimbabwe seem to be taking their toll. I don't really have a lot of peace, and I wonder what it's all about. I mean, this age we live in seems to measure wealth, and it doesn't seem to measure much else. And um, I'm getting to the age now where I'm having a problem with that. Then came the most pressing problem of all. A former business associate, Mohammed Raja, launched a multi-million pound civil action claiming Van Hoogstraten had defrauded him. Mohammed had gone to Nick and had taken out some loans from Nick and uh, the deeds of properties had been left to secure those loans. Uh, that relationship had seemed to have worked for some time. However, disputes started to arise over how much money was actually owed and then there were allegations that those properties had been transferred into Nick's name fraudulently. But it wasn't for fraud that Van Hoogstraten was arrested in September 2001. He was accused of ordering two henchmen to murder Raja, who was stabbed five times and then shot dead in front of his grandchildren at his South London home. According to this year's Rich List, Van Hoogstraten's wealth has plummeted to £65 million and is still falling. Today, aged 57, he was found not guilty of murder, but guilty of the manslaughter of Muhammad Raja. You know, I was the same when I was not so rich as I am now. In fact, if anything, I was worse. According to pe people you know, you could talk to, I've got soft over the years. And the richer you get, the softer you get. So I was worse before.